Well, now then, I'm going to introduce to you Simon Waterfield, who is an actor and a historian, but more importantly for all of us, I suppose, he's Mary, Mary Waterfield's son. So it's, it's lovely to, to welcome you here to this parish again. We first heard Simon, or I first heard Simon, maybe others of you have heard him before, um, in November when you came to do uh, uh, something about, well, you, it was your grandfather's story in the First World War. And it was very moving, and it was done just around um, the anniversary of, you know, the, the 11th of November. It was done the next day, I think, and it was very, very moving. And I talked to Simon afterwards and said, would you like to have something, to do something in Gwil Tisilia? And he, of course, said yes, because although he lives in London, he believes this place is the best place on earth. <laughs> and, he's, and he's not wrong. It is, it is a wonderful place. So we're very grateful to him for coming here today. He's done some research, a lot of research, into the life and times of Tessilio. He's not coming as Tessilio himself, but as one of Tessilio's acolytes. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. You'll have to say the name that you've given your character. Simon develops monologues. Um, this, is, this is his work. And he becomes, as you can see, he becomes that other person. You can see from the clothing and so on, there are artefacts outside. Uh, he really lives the history and is able to, to tell the history as a story to other people. Um, so I'm going to hand over to him in a moment. But just to say, what, what I, I suppose Simon really is, is a time traveller, isn't he? He's giving us a story of someone from another time today. And uh, after the... Wimbledon men's final has, has finished today. They're going to announce the name of the new Doctor Who, the time traveller. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. <laughs> Simon, over to you. Well, this is another world premiere for your list. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> so, you've come to see St. Cecilia, have you? Well, how far have you come? Three days walk, that is a long way this time of, because nobody around here usually goes more than a day's walk from the place they were actually born. But I'm sorry to disappoint you, but Tessilio left here nine months ago. But I don't blame you for coming. Lots of people came to listen to him. They came to hear him preach. They came to watch him. They just believed in what he did. He built bridges, he built bridges between himself and God when he was meditating up on the top of the island up there. He built bridges between himself and the locals and between Christianity and paganism. He was a very good speaker. So, and I'm sorry when you walked across the causeway you uh, found the loose stone. Never mind, I'm sure your tunic will dry off before we get home. It's a nice warm afternoon. But so you're not too disappointed, I'll tell you a story. It's not St. Cecilia's story. His story's still going on. He's elsewhere now. But I'll tell you my story. My story of my time with him. And to be honest, I'm not never quite sure quite how it started. But I've been living close to St. Daniel's for two generations. My family have been there farming. And one day, just so happened that the family were away hunting and I was hoeing a field. And this young man turned up, well, younger than me anyway. Everybody's younger than me. And he was a bit weather worn. He had a rather stained cloak, very muddy boots. He was a bit shorter than me, uh, close curly red hair. And he asked for some water and I gave him some and then he asked for a bit of food as well and I shared some of my honey cakes with him and he started asking me about what I knew about Anglesey well I'd never been to Anglesey I told him it's the other side of the Straits and it's not quite as holy as it is around here there's still paganism over there even the Romans five six hundred years ago they would not driven it out entirely and people came there. There were other people. There was St. Cubby, there was St. Serial. They all came. They, they were like stepping stones over the years, bringing Christianity back into the island. And he said, yes, and that's what I want to do too. And for some reason, I looked at him 
and there was something about him. And I said, do you need any help? Do you want a follower? And he said, yes. And all of a sudden I found myself putting the tools away. I got my cloak and I got my bag with some food in and I said, well, I'll show you where the boats are to take you across. And we started walking towards the boats and he started talking about the island. I said, well, I've not been there before, but what do you want? Where do you want to go? Why don't you go to St. Serial's class over at Penman? What? Well, no, St. Serial's is St. Serial's. That needs to stay. I want somewhere of my own. And I need it to be a bit more private than St. Serial's. Oh, I said, okay because I want to be able to talk to God, to commune with God. I need privacy for that. Okay, well, you're going to an island. It can't be more private than an island. And then I suddenly thought, there are some islands in the Straits. Why don't we see whether one of those might not do? So instead of getting the boatman to take us across to Anglesey, we went down the Straits and we found the first couple of islands, but they didn't work. They were too rocky, they were too tall, and they were too far from the bank. We at least needed to be able to wade ashore at low tide. And then we came round a headland, and all of a sudden, we saw this island. And it was big enough. It was flat enough. We could probably start growing stuff there. There were a couple of big rock outcrops that would give us a bit of shelter. And the boatman said he knew for a fact that you could wade ashore at low tide. Ideal. So we told him to let us off there. Okay, we got ashore and we looked at each other and now what do we do? First thing to do was a shelter. So we cut down some branches, just laid them against a big tree, covered them in bracken and that was our shelter for the first week. And half the time we went out looking for food we went out onto the mainland looking for food and we started building a bigger house, a round house that we could both live in properly, that we could stand up in, that would protect us from the elements. And we started building that behind the big rock over there. And it worked went well for a couple of weeks and it was very nearly built. And then I did say, well, this, all this land belongs to King Yargo. We're really going to have to tell him that we're here and we're doing this because this is his land you're not trespassing on, but he does need to know. He says, Yargo can wait. And I thought, not King Yargo, just Yargo? Hmm, what's that about? So we carried on and then we had our roundhouse built. It wasn't very good to begin with, but it was sturdy enough. And then we started trying to cultivate some of this. We started cutting it the grass down and everything else down to try and make a couple of fields and by then some of the locals had heard and they heard later that there were rumours going around that he was a magician, that he was a druid, that he was a holy man and we'd occasionally get people on the beach wanting to find out about us and when the tide went out Sulio would go out, wade across and he'd start talking to them. And on the beach, he'd set them all in a big circle and he'd start talking to them. And quite soon they were leaving us spread and fruit and vegetables and some grain so we could actually start planting up some of our fields. And this went on. And luckily when the tide came in, we weren't bothered by the locals. He went up, if the weather was nice, onto the top of the island and he would sit there and he would commune with God, talk to God, as, as he said. And people began to see this and they began to wonder. And more and more people came down to the shore and we had to go across more and more often. And over this few months, I saw him grow in stature, in self-confidence, in himself and when he was talking to the locals. And... I kept on saying, we really need to go and see King Yago. And one day he said, right, it's time, we are going to see Yago. Not King Yago, Yago. But I'm not sure where he is. I know he's got a clear somewhere to the west near Aberfrau, but I don't know the way. So he said, we'll just go from community to community and ask. And that's what we did. We walked and it was a good long day's walk and we eventually got there. And I was most impressed the local king's palace, there was a wooden stockade round it with a gate and a soldier on guard. 
But when I walked through, I was amazed. Now, I'd lived next to St. Daniel's Church, and that was the biggest building I'd ever seen. But that was only made of wood and wattle and daub, well as this place. It was made of stone and brick, and there were still red tiles on the roof. And it suddenly occurred to me, this must be a Roman farmhouse. I'd never seen one before. And it looked quite solid as well still, although there were still bits of uh, the roof where the rain was obviously coming in. But Iago came out to greet us and he walked up to Sulio and shook his hand and clapped him on the back. And I thought, that's not how a king recognises somebody for the first time. But we were invited to the king's table and it was a good, some of the best food I had for ages. There was mead, there was meat, there was fish. There was bread with wonderfully finely ground flour, not the bits that I break my teeth on with the usual stuff I eat. There was fruit. There was cheese. It was amazing. And there was mead. Did I tell you about mead? I, I like mead. The best food I'd ever had. And then we were invited to stay the night and we went in this marvellous building. And there was this long corridor with doors on either side. Some of them still actually had closing doors on them. Some were open to the elements and a bit wet. And we had this nice quiet room with brand new straw filled mattresses to sleep on. It was great. And the next morning I had breakfast there again as well. And the food again was wonderful. And I was hoping we were going to stay till the evening meal as well, but we didn't. Sulio and uh, King Iago talked for ages, sometimes in Latin. And I kept looking at Iago and wondering, what makes a king? He looks just like any of the farmers and fishermen you see around here. What made him a king? It's, I suppose it's money and birth and things like that. And so we left after breakfast, unfortunately, and we walked back. And on the way back, Sulio explained a few things. It seems he was the younger son of King Brochvile of Powys. And second sons are a bit useless when it comes to doing anything at all because they're not needed for anything. So he wasn't needed much around the court and he was very interested in God and learning to read and write. So at a very early age, he left his father's court and went to live in a very small settlement at Kaya Megariath. And slowly him and a monk there built up quite a decent sized class and he learnt to read and write there and he decided he needed to go away and to spread the word himself and he heard about Anglesey. He'd heard about Daniel and Cubby and Serial and he thought he'd follow in their footsteps. So that was why he was here and I thought well why does that make him a holy man? And then I realised I'd, I'd heard somewhere that St. Daniel and St. Cubby and St. Sarah were also younger sons of local kings or other important men. Does it mean that you've got to have money and breeding and um, education before you can become a holy man? Well, that left me off the hook anyway, or so I thought. And when we got back, work began in earnest to feed ourselves, make our house bigger and more sturdy. The locals were still giving us some food and by now we had a couple of chickens flying around the island. And I'd made some wonderful fish traps because the fish around here are so plentiful. You can go out into the rocks down there, sink a fish trap or go onto the uh, mud flats over here and put a line out with some hooks. And when the tide's gone out again, you're bound to have fish and we'd hang the fish in the rafters of the house so they cure in the smoke and it was working quite well and more and more people were coming to the beach to hear Sulio and he would wade out and when the tide came in he'd be talking to God up on the hillside there and that went on for a year and we were becoming very successful and then one day he said Ulfurth, I want a church here. And I thought, well, I can get away with building a roundhouse, but a church is way beyond me. What can I do? Tell you what, I'll go back to St. Daniel's and talk to the people there, see whether they can help. So I went back and I met my family for the first time in a few months. 
and that was quite nice. And then I talked to the community there, I told them about Sulia and what he was trying to do and the fact that he wanted to build a church. And they said, we can help, we'll be there in a week or so. And that's what happened. About a week later, a whole group of about 10 men appeared on the foreshore. And when the tide went out, they waded ashore. And we sat down with Sulio and started talking about, well, what do you want out of the church? How big do you want it to be? Where on the island do you want it? Well, it needed to be on somewhere flat. And he wanted it to be visible from the Anglesey mainland and from across the straits and from down the straits as well. Because this was a big thing, building a church. He wanted it to be visible. So we had a think and we paced out where we wanted it to be and then we split ourselves in two. One of, uh, half of the work party went back onto the shore and went into the forest and soon we heard the ringing of the axes and the occasional crash as a tree came down while we started digging post holes and finding big rocks to hold the posts in the holes. And by the next day, some of the big logs were being floated across and then we started assembling it. It's a bit like this roof, but without walls. So just two big timbers like that stuck into the ground, held on a great big long ridge and all tied together. And then once that was upright, we started building a frame along both sides and then we started tying reeds to that to thatch the whole thing. And we had a door at that end. And at this end, one of the locals had built a rough wooden table, which we put there. And then another one of the locals had made a very nice pottery chalice and a plate and it inscribed the shape of the cross on it. And that with a couple of beeswax candles was Sulio's first altar. And after three, oh, he was very pleased with that. And then we both looked at the beach where the locals went and the tide was in. And yeah, none of our congregation can get across. How are we going to do that? And he just looked at me and smiled and said, God will provide. And I looked at him and he said, well, you're not really much like Moses and... Um, the Straits don't really look much like the Red Sea and there hasn't quite the urgency that Moses had at the time, but okay, if that's what you say. And what happened in a couple of days, we heard a great big yell from the shore and there was King Yago with two men, he'd come to visit. So we waved him ashore and he set his horse into the water and he promptly got stuck in the mud and got thrown off. And I thought, the king's gonna get drowned coming to see us. But then he surfaced, laughing his head off, and he dragged his horse over, and his two soldiers were rather more sensible and walked slowly behind him. And he came ashore and he greeted us, slap on the back to everybody, I need some food and drink. Well, you can have some of my mead, sir, and I made some egg, cake, egg pies, you can have some of those. Fine, he said. And then he stripped all his clothes off and just walked into our house and sat down and he and Sulio spent the rest of the day talking. Fine, I went and talked to his soldiers, see whether I could get some gossip about what was happening on the island. And later on in the afternoon, he came out fully dressed. And we said our goodbyes and he went ashore. And one of the things he did outside of Sulio's sight was he said, look after him. And he clapped me on the back and gave me this. And I thought, this is a very big honour because these are extremely expensive things, even for a king. So he does really want me to look after Sulio. It's a shame he never told me how to use it. <laughs> and to be honest, I was a bit worried about this church because it stood up high and people coming up and down the straits could see. And there were always boats coming up and down the sea, traders from the Mediterranean, traders from Scandinavia, and pirates as well from further up north. And when a pirate sees a church, they always think of plates and gold and jewels and stuff like that. And all we had was a crockery plate and a mug. So luckily, the only time I really got scared was I'd, I'd come out of our hut early one morning and I'd put a fire together to brew our porridge for breakfast. 
and there was a sail coming up the straits, great big square sail. And it didn't look much like a trading ship. And I doused the fire as quickly as I could, ruining our porridge for the morning. But it must have been that early in the morning and the sun must have been right in their eyes because they sailed right past and didn't even call. So people do have miracles occasionally. And we did get the, our congregation ashore at low tide. They waded across and they came into our church. And more and more people came to visit and it became very successful. But we still had this problem. Everybody gets wet, you can only do it at low tide. And then about a week after Iago arrived, and I even I called him Iago now, you can't spend a day with a stark naked king and have quite the same respect for him that you used to. And 20 men arrived on horseback with great big wicker baskets. And they came across and said, Yago had sent them to build a bridge or a causeway. So we sat down and what are we going to do? Well, I'd had a go. I cut down some trees as big as I could manage and I dragged them into the straits and even tried to hold them down with stones. But the tide just washed them away all the time. So we decided we just needed stones. So they all disappeared off down all the beaches, collecting all the stones they could find in these big baskets and dragged them back. And then they started laying the bigger stones first and then they put the smaller stones in between and on top. And after two days' work, we actually had a causeway. And you could all, at very low tide, you could almost walk straight across without wetting your feet at all. It was amazing. Wonderful idea. A, our first bridge. And it was used all the time. Of course, it didn't matter that it gave me an awful lot more work here, because... Uh, the locals had given us chickens and they bred, so we had quite a flock of chickens running around here. And we had a goat, and it was fine when it was an island, because they were just stuck on here, they couldn't go anywhere else. And there were predators couldn't get across. But of course now predators could get across at low tide and they could escape, so I had to make pens for them. <laughs> and our vegetable crop and our grain crop, we could now have rats and mice coming across, so I had to build proper storage facilities for that. The work was never ending. But our settlement grew and we became more successful. And then Sulio decided it was time to go out. It was all right talking to the very locals who come on a daily basis to us, but we wanted to go out into the island. But how to do it? How best to approach them? We can't just ride roughshod over other people's beliefs. So how do we bridge the gap between what the locals believed and what we wanted them to believe, shall we say? And they weren't strict pagans, any of them. Everybody had a bit of Christianity. We'd seen that because Sulio was often asked to say prayers over a burial, which was fine, but we'd always see in a corner of the grave there'd be a flask of wine and a little pot of food to send, help send the soul on his way, and that was slightly pagan. So, how to do it? So first of all, we went to the class at Pedman and talked to the people there. How did they manage to do it? And then we spent another night with Iago again, which was good because I did like his food. And his mead. Did I say about the mead? I like the mead. And while we were there at Yargos, I explored more of his place and I went through all the rooms when they were having a chat. And it was great. And I seen his chapel. It's a very appointed chapel with a nice big cross on the altar. And I found this little room right at the end. And it looked just like a little chapel. There were, there were reed um, burners going. And... There was a little altar there as well, but there wasn't a cross on it. There was a carved human head on it. And I suddenly realised that's, that's the face of Woden. So is Iago a pagan as well? And then I thought, well, probably not. Because he's a king of people who are relatively wild, live on the edge of society and have mixed religions. So he probably needs to be in both parties' camps. So... I didn't mention it to uh, Sulio as we came back. But as we came, as we walked home, we thought, well, 
how can we do this? What can we do? How do the religions compare, first of all, so then we can start planning how to move things? Well, what do the pagans believe in? Well, they've got three gods, effectively. They've got Woden, they've got Thunor, and they've got their ancestors. And we've got Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, so there are similarities there. They have special symbols, which they keep in special places. Uh, and we have special symbols, the cross, that we keep in special places, churches and chapels. Whereas their special places are places like standing stones and uh, stone circles and um, burial mounds and votive trees like the big yew down there where gifts would be placed in the branches or in niches in the bark. And there'd be they had um, votive watercourses as well where they'd throw offerings to their gods into the water. So there were a lot of things that compared really at the end of the day. So just as we were walking across our causeway, I said to him, we need to build bridges between all these different ideas to join them together. And he clapped me on the back and I nearly fell in. Well done, he said. And even when I was doing the dinner that night, I was slicing up some turnips and some carrots into a uh, leek broth. And I thought, carrots, turnips and leeks, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. We need to mix it all together. And while we were having our dinner, watching a very beautiful sunset over there, I rather hesitantly suggested this might be a good idea. And he clapped me on the back again and said, you've got the makings of a holy man. I'm going to teach you to read and write. Me? Read and write? I've got enough to do looking after you, never mind learning to read and write. But he taught me on little wax tablets how to write. And they had some big books that he brought with him from Mavel. Very big books, I had to carry them around occasionally. Thick like that, with parchment leaves inside, bound with thick leather and iron staples. But when you open them, the most beautiful illustrated writing. It was a wonder to see. And that's how I learned to read and write. And at the same time, we started going out into the communities, finding out where they were and talking to the locals. And we'd approach a community. And one of the things we'd done to impress them as well was we persuaded Yago to give us a couple of horses because the pagans uh, thought an awful lot about horses. So the sight of us riding in on horses would impress them quite a lot. And then we'd wait to be invited in and we'd, be wait, we'd wait until we were invited to share their food. And then we'd suggest we talk to them about things. And what he would do, and what I did later on, was if there was a burial mound or a standing stone or a stone circle, he'd do his address from next to you or on top of one of those. And if there was a votive tree, he'd stand next to the votive tree and do his preaching and he'd hang one of his big crosses in the branches. And also, uh, if there was a votive uh, waterway, at the end, he would throw one of his wooden crosses into the water and the image of the cross floating on top of the water where all their previous gifts had floated to the bottom was a very powerful symbol and that's how we started spreading the word and that's how we got a bigger and bigger following as we went round Anglesey and eventually more and more people from much further away would come to our church and pray here and eventually after seven years he decided He's done what he can here. Ulfurth, you're now in charge. I'm going away, I'm going back to Mavel to start again and to go somewhere else. And that's what he did. So somewhere in the world, he is still alive. He is still building bridges. He is still mending gaps between people and their religions. And I hope that will happen in many years to come. So, thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you find your own way back. 
and uh, please don't stand on that loose stone on the causeway again this time. That's one of the bridges that we never actually got properly fixed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.